Hi, I'm Paul Beckwith with the University of Ottawa Laboratory for Paleoclimatology. I'm going to talk about some uh, AGU talks that I attended on the jet streams in particular. So, so uh, there was a talk called Extratropical and High Latitude Storms, Teleconnections and Extreme Weather, um, and, and uh, Changing uh, Polar Climate. So this was by Michael Mann. Um, so basically it talked about how ACC, anthropogenic climate change, is changing the planetary wave resonances, um, leading to increases in extreme weather events. So basically persistent wiggles in the planetary waves, or also known as jet streams, mostly in the summer systems. Okay, so basically there's a wave equation, um, if you just I'm not going to go into the math here, but there's a wave equation. So you have a wave of a certain wavelength that travels uh, around the uh, around the Earth. Okay, these Rossby waves. There's a zonal wave number k, and that determines the number of peaks or troughs of the wave. And then you have a meridional wave number uh, l, which determines the extension of the waves. Um, the meridional wave number, and then you have a frequency, so you have a traveling wave, the, the uh, jet stream or Rossby waves is traveling. So when you have stationary waves, the omega zero, you get these stationary or persistent waves. And when this happens, there's something called quasi-resonant amplific amplification, QRA. And if this, um, if the meridional wave number is complex, okay, so it's, it's a complex number, um, then you get um, some, uh, you, you can get some uh, lower latitude uh, wave guiding effect where the wave is actually trapped in a, in a, in a region. Um, when you have um, this, uh, this, this meridional wave number real, so negative or positive, posit you know, a non-complex um, number, real number, then you get this quasi-resonant amplification effect. So when k is 6, 7, or 8, then you get these, um, these, these, these waves kind of trapped around the planet. And that has to do with the, um, that's in the northern hemisphere anyway. That has to do with the topography and things like that. It tends to reach these positions. Now this was published in a paper previously which I discussed in a previous video. So what happens is you get these interesting things happening. This QRA signal is emerging quite strongly. Okay, so if you run historical simulations, these CMIP which is Climate Model Intercomparison Project number five, the latest historical simulations. You can see this fingerprint of this QRA um, uh, appearing, getting stronger and stronger. And in fact, the models show you often get a double peaked jet. So you'll get two peaks. This is, this is when you average it out over time. Now, one of the interesting things with the model is showing, I mean, this is happening with you know, our current situation of Arctic amplification. But one of the things that is interesting is as aerosols are, aerosols have a huge role in uh, cooling the planet, right? So as aerosols are, you know, if as we dramatically phase these out um, by going off fossil fuels, then we'll have a warming of the lower latitudes um, as a result of less aerosols. And this will cause, this will uh, act against Arctic amplification. It's like Michael Mann called it Arctic deamplification. So it'll act against strong uh, quasi-resonant, um, uh, th this QRA quasi-resonant amplification effect, you know, as the mid-latitudes warm dramatically. So that was the key thing in that paper. It was very interesting. Uh, Stacy Porter talked about some paleo work uh, we don't have a lot of, uh, there, there's not a lot of, you know, the, the, uh, the paleo work to actually see how the Arctic is changing, okay? Um, so how do, you, how do you find out what the jet streams are doing based on 
you know what what they did in the past from from uh, paleo records. So like so an ice core was taken on southeast Alaska at forty four twenty meters elevation, so four point four kilometers high elevation. It was drilled in two thousand and two, and it goes back one thousand four hundred and seventy years. Um, now the dating of this ice core is done accurately from dust from the isotopes of oxygen. Um, bomb testing in the 1960s gave tritium peaks and there were six volcanic eruptions over that time period that left dark regions in the ice core. So the ice core is dated fairly accurately. And what happened is it gives you an indication the amount of accumulation in the ice core can be correlated to the strength of the Aleutian low. Okay. Um, when there is, um, there can sometimes be a split low, for example, you know, in two different locations, or you can have, you know, emphasis on a west, the, 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 the Aleutian low can be shifted to the west or it can be shifted to the east of its regular location or more common location. If it's shifted to the west, then there's more accumulation um, in the ice core. If it's shifted to the east, there's less accumulation in the ice core. So the snowfall regime over the over the region where the ice, um, the, where the glacier is in Alaska, the ice core is taken from, can a, it can actually indicate the location of the Aleutian Low, and this gives you an idea as to where the jet stream position would be in that location. So it's then related back to um, something in Francis and Vavris's paper called the Meridional Circulation Index. Um, and it, so it can relate to the, um, to the amplitude of the jet stream waves, how, how wavy they are. And what it found is that um, during warmer periods in the past, like uh, 1200 to 1350 common era and post 1800 common era, the amplified waves uh, were, were larger, and, and that was determined from the location of the Aleutian Low. So very interesting study relating paleo to, to jet streams, because it's very difficult to determine what configuration jet streams had based on, on previous records. Um, then there was an interesting study um, that talked about, okay, so based on, we have the Arctic amplification, we have the Arctic getting a lot darker, the jet streams um, can shift towards the equator as we get warming. Um, so but basically the jet streams affect the Arctic and the Arctic affects the jet stream. So this is like a causal uh, technique. It's not just A causing B, it's A causing B and B causing A. Um, so it looks both ways. So there's some statistics that you can do when you have these causal effects that you're studying. So, so this is like, it's called VAR is the method, vector auto regression. I'm not going to go into the details, but what it showed is it looked at it looked at uh, 37 years of data. Um, so it looked at a whole bunch of different parameters. And what it found out was that when there's a warmer Arctic, it drives stronger winds in the North Pacific. So Arctic temperature goes up, then there's a five day lag. And then the um, the the um, geopotential lines right rise so there, there there's warming basically over the North Pacific and then there's a 20 day lag so this warming over the Pacific creates stronger winds the stronger winds drives drives um, heat up into the Arctic and there's a 20 day lag with that okay so stronger winds in the North Pacific drive warm air into the Arctic so so this um, technique, it compared models and it compared reanalysis data um, and it looked at these feedback loops and it found a very strong effect that, you know, when we get the warming Arctic, then we get a temperature rise in the North Pacific and then this temperature rise in the North Pacific generates stronger winds in the North Pacific and then that drives warmer air up into the Arctic um, and uh, causes even more warming. So that's a very strong feedback effect that is found um, from this analysis. Um, then there was another paper, and Jennifer Francis was a co-author. She wasn't there. It was by, by Judah Cohen, 
Um, and it looked at uh, you know, how a warm Arctic can cause extreme winter weather in the northern hemisphere mid-latitudes. So, you know, we've seen heavy, heavy snowfalls on the east coast of the USA that are associated with the warm Arctic. In particular, the winters 2009-10 and 2016-17. And there's a strong connection to the warm Arctic. So, so um, there's a company, Atmospheric and Environmental Research, AER Incorporated, that was looking at this and it basically confirmed this warm Arctic cold continent trend in the winter. And we're seeing it right now, okay? The Arctic is super warm and it's super cold over North America. Um, <clears throat> the extreme uh, Eastern US winter of 2015, um, basically European uh, winters are getting much more extreme. Um, so basically, you know, the connections, the str there's strong connections to the warming Arctic, um, according to this paper. Um, there was a very interesting paper relating the stratospheric polar vortex pattern and how that affects the um, patterns of wind circulation in the troposphere. So the geopotential heights at 100 hexapascals, so that's up, in the, that's up high um, to where in the stratosphere, um, so that you can get different effects. So um, there can be a very symmetric pattern um, in the stratosphere. Um, you know, there, so there's been, there was a pattern noticed, um, typical duration, 17 days. There were 24 events um, seen in this symmetrical pattern. Um, and then the, the thing can split into two. So the polar vortex can split into two separate vortices, they lasted each about seven days, there were 34 events, and that was 30% of the time, and the symmetric was 70% of the time. Um, and then what happened is these events in the stratosphere were related to um, the, the uh, event, events that we see in the, in the lower atmosphere, the troposphere. So when the polar vortex was symmetrical, we saw a hot Arctic and a cool continent, cool North America, hot Arctic, just like we're seeing, or you can also see a hot Arctic, cool Eurasia. Um, and then when the polar vortex is split, um, then you have the more normal situation of a cold Arctic and hot continents. Um, so you get symmetric, symmetrical and asymmetrical results. And this has to do, there, there, there's vertical transport, um, of the uh, winds from the high, the, the, uh, the, the, the stratosphere down to the um, troposphere. You know, the, again, it's the chicken and the egg. Is it the stratosphere driving the troposphere or the, is it going upwards the other way? The troposphere patterns and going up to the stratosphere. Okay, there's a bit of push and pull from both things. Very, very interesting paper. Another case of causal effect networks. Um, so with different lags like uh, you know, when the vortex changes in the stratosphere, how long does it take for the, for the troposphere patterns to show out and, and, and vice versa. So that's all being looked at, a very interesting, um, very interesting connections uh, between the different components. Um, there was a talk on the PJ index, the Pacific Japan index, and it's uh, not much is discussed, not much is studied because, you know, climate data tends to be a lot of, uh, North American centric stuff, but it's uh, you know how the El Ninos tie in and stuff. There were there was discussions on that, um, and uh, you know uh, Steve Bavaris and Francis were in another talk. Neither of them were there. The talk was by Fuyeo Wong. Probably mispronounced that. It talks about the tug of war between zonal and meridional temperatures you know, using the community earth system model to study it. You know, zonal temperatures warm the land, meridional temperatures cool the land, that's a tug of war and what happens in the future between those two things. You know, does the land warm first, pulling the oceans up or do the oceans warm first? So there's different dynamic terms and thermodynamic effects that are going on. Um, and, uh, you know, the Arctic warming is phenomenal you know, before the 1990s, it was 0.6 degrees C per decade. After the 90s, it was 1.67 degrees per decade. 